Hello and welcome to the MHG podcast. Once again, life can be a little bit miserable, life can be a little bit dark. So we're here to bring you a little bit of light and hopefully plenty of Halloween joy. I'm here with the ghost of Christmas future at Halloween thingy, Stu. How are you doing, Stu? <laughs> well, it's kind of blending two different tropes, but I kind of like it. Yeah, no, I, yeah. you could be like the Halloween thing and the Christmas thing could be you're the ghost who doesn't bring people presents. That's kind of... Stu Skellington, you could be. Stu Skellington. All right, let's go with that. Spooky Stu Skellington. Yeah, there we go. yeah. And Boo Radley. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, yeah. There's our Halloween special. There you go. Nice. Uh, we've, we've, done, we've done what we needed to do. Got some spooky games to talk about later, but there we go. We've done our Halloween bit. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah. Oh, dear. It's, yeah, it's Halloween. Hall- My daughter really loves Halloween. I've got to say that. Edith absolutely adores Halloween. It's her favourite holiday. She had, like We spoke to her about it. She said, like, she, if she could only choose one holiday in the year, what would it be? It'd be Halloween. She'd get rid of Christmas, the others, like Easter, all of those. She'd get rid of them and just have Halloween. Nice. I love it. I, I never used to give her monkeys. and It's a fun yeah, one, Yeah, it, it is fun. Yeah. And it's an excuse to watch a ton of horror films and horror shows and stuff. So... Yeah. And what I like about it is if you don't want to do it, no one's that bothered. So you don't get dragged into it. Um, like you do Christmas and all the other stuff, you know. You know, I was giving out like Halloween cards. You don't, Hallmark. Don't you ever dare do that, right? But no, I was giving out Halloween cards. You haven't got to buy presents for Halloween. And if someone does want to like do their house up, it's like always people are really into it. So and like I like you've got the rules now where you only go and do trick or treat on ones where it's obvious they're into Halloween. Um, yeah. And so it's it's a much nicer holiday. I just think it's a it's a, lo- it's a lovely holiday. Um, yeah. Apart from the thirtieth, obviously, because that's busy night um, up in the northwest. Um, that much I do know where it's mischief night. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, no Halloween. It's, it's I've kind of not gotten into it. I won't dress up. I won't dress up, Stu. But I, it's for the kids. I think it's brilliant. I think it's one of the best holidays because they've got to work for their presents. <laughs> but yeah, they have. But like you say, it's good because like it, it's one. It's the only. I think. Well, okay, Easter may be a little bit, where you kind of, you buy stuff for yourself and for your own fun, rather than it be chuck a load of money at gifts that people don't want and probably won't yeah. use. Um, Even that's becoming now giftable, though. It's like yeah. you get your Halloween chocolate, your Halloween present, or the Halloween, sorry. No, don't, Hallmark, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Um, Easter, you get your, ha- your Easter egg and then your Easter present and stuff like that. And even we've fallen into that trap because the other kids get it. So you kind of got to do it for your kid, otherwise they're left behind. And yeah. Um, so Halloween's the only one. Yeah, I uh, I have a I don't like Easter much. I love that time of no, year, but it's it's a, just a pain in the ass. And Easter cards, you can roll them up tightly and shove them up your nose or another orifice. So, you know. My, my, fa- my the favourite thing about Easter is you can turn around to uh, strict Christians and you could go, oh, that's the one that's based on pagan. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, that's Cause it. Because it changes as the moon changes. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Where, where in the Bible are the things about brightly coloured eggs and Easter bunnies, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But, you know, when did, when, when did Jesus resurrect? Because I thought he could only resurrect once. He didn't resurrect based on the moon, did he? So, yeah. You celebrate Easter when you want, but admit that you, you know, the witches and the pagans and everything like that, they're the real heroes here. Definitely. Uh, talking of real heroes. Yep. I interrupted you. You're the real hero. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah, I am the real hero. So please worship me. Where, when's Stu Skellington yeah. Day? That's what I want to know. But go on. Is this how? Is this where we do is that our Stephanie Sterling thing? We're going to finish off now, guy. And, and please worship Stu. Yeah, I think we have to. Yes, there we go. Uh, talking of worship, um, Oof. people worship video games, Stu. <laughs> yeah, they kind of do. They really do, uh, don't they? Well, they, do. they, they they're, they're games console overlords. They, they like to worship those, because at the moment, I believe Sony are the high worships with the Spider-Mans. Um, and Nintendo with the uh, Mario's, but not, not um, Microsoft with the... the 
poorly made faltzers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Interesting. they can't buy a win. At the no, moment, they can't. Can they? Can they? Literally, games. literally can't buy a win. It's uh, yeah, because uh, that that should have been their their home run. That should have been uh, their like right. Tell you what, this is our guaranteed three points right here, Forza. Oh God, we've blown it. We've blown it at home, and we've let in a ninety-first minute equaliser. What are we gonna do? We can't know, recover we, from this. I know. Um, I. I I don't know. Uh, there's no halo on the horizon. The Activision stuff. They've had to announce the Activision stuff. They can't bring anything to Game Pass from Activision until 2024, which I know is not far away, but everyone was kind of expecting. They've got Activision. Give me the free Call of Duties. That hasn't happened. Um, so I don't know. Um, if only there was a fourth option out there, Stu, where you didn't have to worry about all these wars. I know. Give peace a chance. Give console war peace a chance. Give PC a chance, are you saying? Oh. Give PC a chance. Yeah, it was right there for me. Open goal. It was right yeah, there, Stu. Microsoft it style. Was, it was right there. Missed it. Uh, yeah, you missed that open net. Um, I am, I, I, I'm turning more, as the, as the weeks and months go on, I'm turning more into an arsehole when it comes to sort of like I'm PC now. Um, I just, I look at consoles and I just go, they're so limited. You know, a PlayStation might be cheaper than a PC, like a fully decked out PC. But to play a feat, you've got your, 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 your Nintendo Switch, your PlayStation 5, your Xbox Series X. You're spending well over the cost of a single PC where you can play most of the games legally and pretty much all the games if you're willing to do a bit of corporate espionage. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, there's... There's the yeah. There's the exclusives that make it a bit challenging. Um, oh, oh no, I might not get Microsoft ones. Yeah, <laughs> there is that. Yeah, I like your Last of Us ends up on PC eventually as well. But yeah, yeah as yeah. will Spider Man too. You know yeah. it's going to come because the other two have. Yeah, um, I think literally the only ones that I'm worried about are Drive Club, which is dead in the water anyway. You'll never see again. Um, but eventually. That'll be emulated, so screw it. Wipe out Omega Collection. Sony are just leaving money in the, on the table there. So uh, I can imagine that at some point will come, come in. And Blood Ball, that As soon as they announce Blood Ball for PC, that's instant millions into their pocket, I reckon. And I don't think they'd even need to do a 4K remaster of that. They could just go, yeah, go this Blood Ball for PC. <laughs> well, I know... Going off, we're going off on a real tangent here, but it's probably worth pursuing a little bit. But yeah, uh, my, my, yeah, obviously, huge PC guy. I prefer it to all the other platforms, basically. But I, even seeing some people get the Steam Deck and get kind of confused, even on the forum that we go on, where people are kind of more techy and have followed games for a long time, yeah, and still getting confused about compatibility and settings and stuff there's still a big big hold back for a lot of people from from the pc i think and at, at the moment we're in a really bad place as well because we're in a place where the they're not optimal games are not well optimized for pc at mm. all it's really really bad and like mostly because uh, yeah, I mean, we're in danger of going really down a rabbit hole, but very, very briefly, as briefly as I can make it. Unreal Engine 4, good, but needs a lot of tweaking to make sure that you don't have all sorts of problems with it, um, with frame rate. And Unreal Engine 5 is, is riddled with problems and is really needs a lot of high-powered machinery to run it well. Um, we've got problems with Unity. You know, th- there's a lot of trouble in that space at the moment. And a graphics card cost, Jesus, they are so expensive. So mm. if you're already into the PC marketplace and or you want a Steam Deck, brilliant. If you're not in it, don't buy into getting a desktop gaming PC unless you really, really, really want to do it. That's my advice. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I see. My, my uh, PC, I've got a 2060 graphics card in there, an i5, something called other processor. Um, and I know now that if I want to upgrade, I'm now at that stage where I've, I've missed the boat and I'm going to have to go new graphics card, motherboard, um, RAM, the lot. 
um, processor, I've got to go literally build a UPC. Um, so that that throws that out. But uh, this is where I think the Steam Deck is the best thing to happen to PC gaming for a long time. It's giving, for the first time, games developers something to target. Um, yep. Because they can go, right, so if we can build it and work on a Steam Deck... The other tweaks should be easier. Now, I'm not, they're not all doing it. You know, uh, Metal Gear Solid Collection, case in point, is bad. Um, after games don't work, um, and there's very little effort being put into them. Uh, however, I, I'm a sucker. I'm glad just to have them. And I know at some point, someone will make them work, even if the official developers don't. Um, look back at Arkham Knight, for example. People made that work um, really well in the end. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's... They are, we're going through the humps. I don't think that's going to be a case moving forward because what will happen, I think you'll get Valve, will, when they eventually do a Steam Deck 2 or an upgrade, whatever they decide to call it, because that's going to be interesting how they market a second Steam Deck. What they could do is they go, right, now we know what we're doing. We know this thing could be a success. We're actually going to get these shipped early, the specs shipped early to developers, so they can target this for future games rather than playing catch up. So I think the next Steam Deck and what happens from then, I give PC developers now that target that they get with consoles that they've never had before. So I think it will improve. However, not a conspiracy theory as such, but PC, the PC market is still lesser in terms of valuation to developers than the console market. So their lead platforms are still consoles. So I, I still think that a lot of PC games are just put out there with, uh, we know there's a community out there that can do stuff. We can get to it later. We just got to get these consoles. We've got to get them on the Xbox and the PlayStation and the Switch where possible because that's where the money is. But, you know, because you get your, they'll get their cuts from the live services or the online services, Game Pass, uh, PlayStation Plus, Nintendo Online, all, all that cut that goes there. Plus, they get a bigger percentage, I believe, per sale from those. So they're going to, and they'll get more sales. Um, whereas with PC, it's all lesser. You don't get paid for online services because there aren't any paid for online services. Um, there's no, like, Valve, for example, they don't offer subscription services, etc. So there's less money there for them. But I can see that changing soon as the sales start to level off. Because at the moment, they may be losing 10, 15% of sales on PC that don't go well. But if that goes up and that starts getting to, say, a 25% split and everyone's split equally... That's a lot of money to leave on the, on the on the table that they've then got to try and bring back in. So, I, again, it's going to improve. We're just now in that, we're in the trenches at the moment, so to speak. And we'll, you know, it's up to us, or via the podcast, via other gamers on forums, to make the noise, to call out the bullshit where it's there, call out the poor ports, even if we personally like the game, um, and make sure that our voices are heard so they know there is a market there and they've got to start getting on top of it at some point. So, yeah, it will improve. That is a really big tangent, Stu. It really, <laughs> really is. Well, yes, it is, but it is a good one. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I agree. And I think, you know, we're, we're in a really weird space because of how much happened during COVID and how much disruption there was during COVID and how much the marketplace has been screwed up by Microsoft doing all sorts of weird acquisitions and spending money in the wrong places as per usual for the last sort of 10 mm -hmm. or 15 years. And it will level out a little bit, which is good. But yeah, anything that kind of flattens and, and stabilises. I, I like disruption, like positive disruption, but I think the industry needs a bit of stability at the moment. I think that's the key thing it needs. Yeah. Yeah. And I say, I think the Steam Deck has just been, the, in a good way, the biggest spanner in the world. Yes. Forever. Yes, it has. It has. It's because changed. I say it's the first time they've had to go, fuck, PC gaming. Oh, right. Okay. Linux? What? But the, the Valve have gone, no, no, no. Look, you make it for Windows. Don't you worry. You just concentrate on how you want to develop it. We'll get it working on Linux. Um, because, yeah, recently, just to call out, like, EA, you just don't give a shit. Right, which is really bad, and they've got to start giving a shit about Linux. And they didn't, give a, they didn't care about the Nintendo Switch for God knows how long. Um, 
like Burnout Paradise just flat out did not work on um, Steam Deck or Linux builds. Um, Burnout Paradise Remastered, sorry. Um, now, some Proton updates, it works. Um, still shows as unsupported because it's not updated because it's only on uh, Proton Experimental at the moment. But all of a sudden, that works. So the continuing work that is going on there. So EA haven't got to get involved at all. But Valve do the work and go, well, your game now works on this system. It didn't work before. Valve will show how that works with compatibility. Now, if we can get that with accessibility as well, we are well on to a great future for video games. Um, uh, you know, as long as they don't try and monetize it. That's going to be the only downfall. If they try and monetize all this stuff, that's where the issues start to arise. But so far, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling really positive about the future and all thanks to the Steam Deck. And when I said Steam Deck would change the face of gaming, people laughed at me, Stu. <laughs> people went, don't be so stupid. <laughs> but I'm right, Stu. As always, As I've got a better hit rate than Stephanie fucking Sterling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. You are the prognosticator of prognosticators. Definitely. Uh, now, what have you been playing? <laughs> we should probably get onto that, the core of the, uh, the podcast. Though. Yeah, probably a good idea. There's a lot idea. of games. Yeah, there's a good few to cover. And this one, yeah, the, the biggest one. So, Super Mario Wonder. Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Or some Super Mario Bros Wonder, as you're supposed to say. Is it? I thought it was just Super Mario Wonder. No, Su- Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's something you every day. Every day is a school it, day. It is, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. Um... Or not, because school was horrible. But, um, yeah. No, school wasn't horrible. Well, primary school wasn't horrible. Secondary school was. But anyway. It was for me. I got bullied and tried to kill myself. Well, there, there you go. go. Exactly. But <laughs> if you know. Sorry. <laughs> Just to change the tone of the part. We're talking about Super Mario 1, the suicide. There you go. <laughs> yeah, let's chuck that in there. But, um, yeah. yeah. Go on, Joe. Save, save the podcast before it goes off tangent Okey again. dokey. So, yeah, wonder. So, obviously, there's not really much point me going into how it plays in detail and, you know, that sort of caper because everybody in their gran is going to be talking about that and everybody's played it, you know, selling like hotcakes. So just talk around it a little bit and talk about some very personal experiences and oddities and stuff like that. I think it's probably a better way to do it. So, yeah, first off, mic drop. This isn't in my top tier list of Mario games, right? So... My, I've done a tier list, and I'll probably, if I can remember, link it <laughs> link it to the podcast on Twitter. Um, my top tier list is the likes of Galaxy, Mario 3, Mario World, Yoshi's Island, uh, mm. those. Um, but with Mario games, Mario platformers, there's no bad ones. They're all good. It's just degrees of brilliance. And mm-hmm. for me... Wonder has got a lot of stuff in it that's similar to, on the positive side for me, Yoshi's Island. So it's a bit of a departure. Um, And on the slightly more negative side, Mario Odyssey, which I wasn't a big fan of. Now, I'm not saying Mario Odyssey is not great, because it is. It's just like... That's in people's god tier, isn't it, Mario Odyssey, for some? It is, it is. And the thing is, is that like Tears of the Kingdom... Nintendo AAA stuff is built on, and I don't mean this as a pejorative, but they're built on a gimmick. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're built on something that is like a new, or at least an extremely streamlined, polished feature that we've not seen before or not seen in this context before. It's something that's, you know, unique to Nintendo, at, at least in the way that it's been brought to a console and right back to like you know Majora's Mask or Metro even just like Metroid the first Metroid you know just taking stuff and doing it in a different way and that's what they did with Odyssey and I didn't click with it but loads did um doesn't mean I don't think it's a great game but the same's here here really and I think for me the fact that it's not that difficult and which makes it a bit shorter and that lack of, that, not lack of challenge, but that lower challenge where the challenge comes in the extras rather than in the main game. Yeah. That, not on its own, is not a problem because I like a romp. You know, um, Yoshi's Paper World or whatever it was called was a romp. Too easy in a way, but I still loved it. Um, yeah, so that in itself is not a, a, that much of an issue. But the levels are kind of 
built around a different gimmick each time, which was very much the core of Odyssey and was slightly what built Yoshi's Island. And it's that kind of, you've got a few vectors of change. And in this one, it's the Wonder Seed. So when you get the Wonder Seed, the level changes into something different. And it's, yes, it does. it's a cracking idea, you know, and it's really good. And most of them I really enjoy. But there's that kind of through thread of, right, okay, we're focusing on two, let's say, power-ups, you know, or just one power-up, or a, an iconic power-up, like, you know, the, the raccoon suit in three, or the, the cape mm-hmm. in four, uh, you know, Mario World, um, or, you know, laying the eggs and spitting the eggs in Yoshi's Island. They, they've they actually created a few power-ups, and they've also split some powers off into things that you can choose in a menu. It makes it a bit more diffuse, and a lot of people will like that. So it's not just, oh, I've just got to go and grab the Tanuki suit and everything will be fine. It's more of a strategic, oh, I can pick this thing for this type of level. Um, if only that was the ethos for life. Indeed. By the way, indeed. I've just got to go and get the Tanuki suit and, suit and everything will be fine. So. I know, it'd be great. But yeah, so the, the power-ups in this, I, I think, are okay, but nothing special. Um, mm-hmm. I won't go into them because uh, you know i know most people have seen them in the trailers but i don't want to do any spoilers yeah but i'm not i don't they're fine you know they're good you enjoy them because you enjoy playing the game and you enjoy playing the game because the core of the game is fantastic you know they've tightened up the controls from what they lost in the new super mario brothers games of which i played all four and i know that the the 3ds ones were only a variant on the the wii ones and the wii u ones but they were they were games in their own right. So it's four whole games. Um, yeah. It controls way better than those. The controls are peerless. The graphics are fantastic. The audio is great. The, the music's eh, okay. Not amazing. Uh, but the presentation's perfect. There are some fantastic ideas in there. Core thing is, to me, it feels more scattershot than Galaxy, which also, like Odyssey, threw a lot of ideas at the wall. But I think that Galaxy tied them together in a way that was genius, whereas Odyssey tied them in a way that was a sort of bit haphazard. So, yeah, it's it's like absolutely brilliant game. It's one of the games of the year. It deserves all of its success. Personally, for me, it's a, it's not S rank, it's A rank. And that's all I can say, really. Which is fair enough. Um, so, a couple of thoughts. Um, so your tier list, my tier list, you know, Mario 3 um, and uh, Mario World are my god tier, absolute god tier. Um, and they are the only ones in my god tier. They stand out from every other Mario game by a long shot for me. Um, both of those, well, okay, Mario World is in my top three all time along with Tetris. Um, it, you know, that, that and that will stay there, I don't care. Yeah. Um, um, and like Mario 3, that will hover depending on what mood I'm in and stuff like that into into that top 10, top 20, whatever. But it's there. Um, everything else is A tier for me. Not because they're bad, but because they're just like, they are not, no game has ever touched um, those two for me. Um, Mario Galaxy, I struggled with. Um, now, I can see it's a great game. And I've played it, and it is a great game. But I, I realise why that's my ADHD brain, for whatever reason, can't cope with controlling Mario and then controlling the wand to collect the stars separately. Yeah. Cannot cope with that one iota. And all I hope for is one day a remaster, remake, whatever of that, where that side of it is automatic, where it just goes, I oh, will collect all the stars for you. You just go and enjoy it. Um, much in the way that you Super Mario Brothers games have um, the Luigi mode where it pretty much plays that bit for you or gets you through a level. It needs that for the collecting bits in, in Mario Galaxy because, as I said, my brain just can't handle it. I can tell it's brilliant. I preferred Mario Odyssey um, to Galaxy. But you're, t- you're sort of going, what's your favourite through Apples or Oranges there? Um, yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with either of them. Yeah. Um, now, Mario Wonder, I've played a very little amount of it because um, I, I said to you off air, I'm having problems with my eyes and the colours are just too overwhelming for me at the moment. Uh, but also, I got to that first um, seed 
Um, and there's a musical number with Petey Piranha plants everywhere. And I don't know if that could ever be topped um, in the game. So I don't know if I'm done because I think I've played the best part of the game already. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> because I literally, I played that and just went, what have I just played? That was amazing. Um, so, yeah. And I will go back to it. Who am I kidding? It's a Mario. I will go back to it. But um, just answer me this. Have, did they front load the game or does the quality continue throughout? Well, I mean, that's kind of part of my thesis, really, in that it, it's it's rocky for me. It goes up and down quite considerably all the way through. And you're as likely... Good for a platformer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're as likely to encounter a level that you're not as impressed with as you are one that you are. Um, I don't think everybody shares that opinion, but you see, I'm a little concerned about the internet binary again on this, in that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you get everything has to be perfect. Um, you also, oh, yeah, you're wrong. Yeah, you have to sorry, fall into a go. camp of either being right yeah. and it being brilliant, or being wrong because you got a couple of issues with it. And then six months down the line, you get all of your, you know, op-ed pieces that go, "Were we wrong about Wonder?" You know, and it's just like, well, I, I don't do that. I'm just honest about how I feel. And I genuinely yeah. feel that some of the gimmicks are just end up as good. You know, they end up as yeah. fun, but they don't em- end up fine. as brilliant. And I think that when we're talking about your favourites, not even bringing mine into it, uh, when you're talking about 3 and, and World, there's there's nothing in it that doesn't land. Uh, again, a platform thing that you do. Um there's nothing in it that doesn't... Off that one level where I kept not landing and I had to rip that god. Precisely. Off. But yeah, um, I, I just feel that when you're into that god tier, when Nintendo are totally flowing, the, the games flow in that same way. And I do think it is because of that whiteboard philosophy of them splitting things out and saying, come up with an idea and then run with it. And then people being allowed, you know, different parts of the development team being allowed to insert those things in rather than it be here's the design philosophy, you have to stick with that for the entire game. You can deviate from it, but it has to be mm-hmm. along the main branch. Um, and there's there's good and bad, which is why, for me, some of it doesn't land. But I like the fact they try. Anyway, I like that fact. I watched uh, a Scott the Woz video last night talking about GameCube, uh, first-party GameCube games. Right. And he says pretty much that exact same thing. That era Nintendo tried things. And it didn't matter if it landed or not. They tried things. Um, you know, you got to look at when they done Star Fox Adventures. If you go back and play Star Fox Adventures, it's a good game. It's just not a good Star Fox game. But they tried something. Um, you know, it's uh, Mario Sunshine. It's a bit of a um, uh, one that splits opinion. Um, some see it as one of the best Mario games, others see it as one of the worst ever Mario games. Uh, but he said, like, if you go and play that and then play, uh, like, uh, uh, Mario 64, the controls in Sunshine are so, so tight compared to 64. It's, like, night and day better. Um, and, you know, they tried a new gimmick that some people didn't like, but they tried. And then Nintendo tried to go safe. And safe Nintendo, boring. Nintendo taking risks... That's good Nintendo. Um, and they've done that on the Switch era. And, we, you know, and they've tried it with, with Mario. You know, they tried to do an XCOM Mario with, with unfortunately, with Ubisoft. But, um, obviously, they started that before all the crap came out as well. Um, as I think they probably would have distanced themselves early because of their family-friendly image. But, anyway, they've done that, which is a risk. An XCOM Mario game is a massive risk, especially with the Rabbids. Um, you know, and it, it, it worked. Um, Mario Odyssey was probably their safe game, but then they done, you know, along with Tetris, you know, Tetris 99, you know, a, a, a puzzle game, Battle Royale, which is then spread out. And now you've got F-Zero as a 99 game, and apparently it worked. You know, they take these risks, and that's the best in Nintendo, because that's when they drive innovation. Uh, the, the, the Wii was a risk. The Wii U was safe. And they went, oh, let's just do more of the Wii. And then the Switch was another risk. You know, where we are going, look, we're going to say straight from the back, we're not powerful as the as powerful as the others. We're getting rid of the handheld and the uh, the home console, and we're merging them. That had never been done before. That has never been done before. And that has then led 
to the evolution of, as we said, like the Steam Deck and stuff like that. Maybe not directly, maybe it's already there, but it's led to go, actually, this can work. And that's a risk. And the games that came out on it, you know, the size and scope of uh, Breath of the Wild is a massive risk compared to what the other games were. Um, And so that Nintendo's great. And as you said with um, Super Mario uh, Brothers Wonder, it might not hit consistent 100% oh, of the time. It probably hits consistently, but not 100% of the time. Um, and, yeah, you can pick faults. And the, the good thing about this, and this is why we don't do review scores and why I like it, is you can love a game, and you can really enjoy a game, and you can pick faults with it. And that's important. Um, and Nintendo, as long as they go, okay, Right, this is what hit. Um, what can we do next? You know, where do we go? What do we develop? What was wrong with these parts? And they listen properly, not just listen to the white noise that comes through. Then this could be the start of another mini franchise of theirs. Because they like to do like mini franchises with their Mario games, I've noticed. Um, so like New Super Mario Brothers, that is kind of a mini franchise within it and so on. So could we get a Mario Brothers 1 to 2 or do they take the good ideas from this and split off completely again? But yeah, you know, as you said, when you're talking some issues with a Mario game, you're looking almost for these issues. And it's stuff like if this was, um, I don't know, James the, the Jumping Rabbit, um, platformer title debut, you'd probably be praising it to absolutely the hill as the best new IP to come since Mario because it's doing all these things. But because it's Mario, the expectation levels are so high that you do have to to not go overboard. Just go, oh, these things don't quite hit as well as you would expect from another Mario game. Um, and it's a that's it. It's a nice problem to have in it for Nintendo. Absolutely. <laughs> they are pretty much on a sale, but we, I, we keep going back to saying that Astro Bot in, in VR is like, the only kind of game that's like challenged the throne kind of thing yeah. um, in the last oh, 15, 20 years, probably. Yeah. Um, and it's still there. And like, I think that's a better game than Wonder. But I, that wouldn't mean that if I was reviewing it for someone that did scores that I would score it lower. Um, I think I'd probably still score them the same. It's just in my mental tier list, <laughs> Astro Bot would Jeez, be a bit why? higher. Do you know what I mean? Which is why scores are bullshit. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. And there's a level, you know, you look at Sonic. What, when you go to a new Sonic game, do you go into it with high expectations or low expectations? I always go into it with low expectations and sometimes get pleasantly surprised. Rock bottom. <laughs> right? Sometimes I go with low expectations and somehow still get disappointed. Yeah. Um, it's like Superstars, apparently. It's all right. Sonic Superstars is all right. But I've got no expectations for that because it looks a bit like Sonic 4 graphically. So I'm like, this is going to be absolute trash. I've played the first couple of levels. It's all right. It's fine, but it's not Mario. No, no, absolutely um, not. And I'm a big fan of Sonic. Don't yeah, you know, I will defend Sonic. Those first no two D Sonic games are the best. I like Sonic Generations. You know, I, yeah. I'm big on Sonic Generations. I think that's a brilliant game. Um, it's good. And yeah, um, yeah. I think the only games that can match Mario are I think Sonic Two um, and Sonic Mania. Um, they are the absolute god tier Sonic games. Uh, yeah. By the way, so there you go. Oh, Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed is better than Mario Kart. I'm not a fan. We'll, we'll pick up Mario Kart in another episode because, yes. yeah, I am not a, Mar- a fan of, of modern Mario Karts in any way. I don't play them, um, but we'll come back and to that. We need to talk about we need to talk about some other stuff because we haven't got onto our Halloween special stuff yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> on our Halloween special, Ooh. moving on. No spooky stuff yet, but I've been playing Alaska Road Truckers uh, because I'm a bit of a sucker for these these uh, simulation games. Um, you know, Euro Truck Simulator, Microsoft Flight Simulator, Power Wash Simulator, all, all of these kind of things. Um, Snow Runner, all of those. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, I quite like that um, Ice Road Truckers when it was on TV. That was quite fun to watch at times um, as pure trash TV. So yeah, Alaska Road Truckers. I, was, I saw that and I was like, yeah, give me a go at that. Now, what this has decided to do to separate itself from your other simulator games is this is more of a life simulator, but as a trucker. 
So you drive your truck for miles upon miles upon miles doing deliveries and stuff, uh, standard fare. But you have to go and make sure you stop at a refueling station to refuel. You've got to make sure you're hooking up your stuff. You've got to uh, manage your own hunger and all, all kind of things like that. So you've, or everything that you have in life as a trucker, you've got to do. Um, so it's maintaining your vehicle. You've got to do full preparation, um, check the weather, etc. about what, what's going to come. Um, and the concept behind this is absolutely brilliant like you 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 have to plan your routes properly um and you need to get yourself different trucks for doing different things you have to pick up your you have to go and visit a store like physically go and visit a store in the game to get the stuff you need so it's not just like a menu um so it, it's um you can kind of go out and about like you could just get out your truck and go and wander wherever the hell you want as as well um and you know, you do have health issues, so you could get really ill in the game, and you, you suffer fatigue, and you suffer from the cold, and that can affect your performance for driving, and that, what you see on the road, and stuff like that. Um, but there's, like, disasters, so you might have to come across a fallen tree, can you get it moved, do you have to replan, all kind of things like that. It's a very in-depth simulator. And in this game somewhere, there is a good game. However, the problem I've come, well, I have with it at the moment, is it runs like absolute trash um, on desktop PC and on Steam Deck. It's, it's yeah, the performance just absolutely lets it down. So I don't feel I've been able to experience the game as it's meant to be experienced to decide whether I think this is a brilliant game or just, you know, something that's all right that I'll play for five minutes. Because every time I get going in it, I then get, like, single-figure uh, frame rate drops. I get crashes. Um, I get button prompts not working. Sort of, like, at one point, um, it was obviously in a refueling tutorial. So I went to try and refuel my truck, and it let me choose how much fuel I wanted to put in. Um, so this is all you have to do, like, you go there, you have to go, right, I want to put this much fuel into my truck, and then you lift the nozzle and put it into your tank. But it would, the prompt for letting me lift the nozzle wouldn't work at all. I drove out the thing, I went back, still wouldn't let me do it. Um, and I was nearly on empty, well, about halfway into my fuel, and it wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me do it, despite that being a tutorial. So lots of little bugs like that that worked when I had to restart the game from scratch, it then let me do it. But I don't want to be restarting a game like this every five minutes because the opening's quite meandering. Like, it's taking you through everything you've got to do. And it's like, oh, I just want to get on the road now. Uh, but there's a really good game in there somewhere. Uh, weird things that need fixing, such as, like, other uh, vehicles on the road don't drive at the speed limit. They drive way below the speed limit. So you're in this truck you know, going along at maybe 50 on a 55 mile an hour road and there's a car in front of you, like almost feels at a standstill and you run into the back of it because you just don't expect this road, this car not to be moving. Um, and yeah, it's a good, good game, I think. But bugs and performance, this isn't ready to come out yet. This needs more time cooking. Um, and I think there will be something worth playing there. But just at the moment, oh boy. It's trash. I mean, or is it in early access or is it actually the full release? No, it's out. Oh dear. I'm just actually just double checking. St- yeah, it's, it's a release game. Yikes. But it's it's purely performance. I don't know what what happened. Why they had to get this out? Um, uh, generally, I I wonder. Oh, maybe it's my setup. Sometimes you know, because I said like my my setup on the Steam Deck. I try and play immediately on the Steam Deck and then on desktop if it doesn't work. And I thought, oh, maybe it's just something to do with me. Maybe it's something I've No, it's generally um, the, the the faults of everyone who's played it is, this is really cool, but it shouldn't be released yet. Um, so someone, you know, who's playing, like, who can brute force it. I see someone who said they're, like, on a 40-60, um, like, really, like, massive, uh, excuse the pun, rig. Um, and they can get performance out of it, but yeah, it looks like at times it lo- <clears throat> it doesn't look like a modern modern game in terms of ray tracing stuff like that. This looks like visually this would be at home on 
a PS3 360. And that's not to say that's bad graphics, because I think they are still great graphics on those systems. Uh, maybe an early PS4, um, Xbox One title, but it's not pushing the limit. So I, I don't know. Hopefully, I really, really hope they can get something from this moving forward. But at the moment, yeah, good game. Runs like trash. Stick to your Euro Truck simulators at the moment if you're after that experience. Yeah, fair play. Let's hope they're able to put the the work in and get it sorted. Yes. Yes. Uh, Yeah, because you can tell they've put love into the game. There's a lot of love in this game, but yeah, it's just not working at the moment. Sorry, developers. Uh, What you got, like, quickly from you, Stu? Uh, What have you got? Let's move on, because I want to get a spooky scene. Yeah, fair play. So, yeah, I've I've been playing Ghost Runner 2, and... If you remember, sort of spooky <laughs> ghosts. Um, yeah, it's got nothing to do with ghosts. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so if you remember, I was a huge fan of the first game uh, when it came out, and just it's it's one of my all time as it's in my top one hundred. Absolutely love it. So I kind of stumbled a little bit with the new one as as I started with it because it's it's kind of very different in a way, which you know you'd think it would be very difficult to be very different, but it, it's got. Uh, yeah a, a real change uh in the kind of in the core loop um which is good i think i'm falling on the side of good um so basically you know as as with the previous game so you you're a kind of one hit kill machine glass cannon that can be killed in one hit so there's like you know it's traversing levels first person killing stuff with your sword for the most part being killed instantly for the most part and doing instant restarts to get through the level, similar to Neon White, similar to Mirror's Edge, and running on walls and parkour. And what this adds is a lot more regular kind of level traversal platforming that you'd expect from a, you know, Mario game, uh, from a Metroid. It's much more like a 3D Metroid than the previous game. Um, which may be a huge boon to some people and will probably open the market up for them quite a bit. So what I mean by that is uh, not necessarily backtracking because there doesn't seem to be much of that, but there's much more kind of um, kind of press this to open this door and use this lever to create this action and kill this enemy who's protecting this thing. Whereas the previous game was like, you're in an arena, you're bouncing around the arena and killing stuff, and then it opens the door to the next stage. So it's more sophisticated in that way. It starts off even more brutally hard than the previous game, which you think, how is that even possible, Stu? But they've managed it, and it is so, so hard. Um, Really, that you have to... There is normally kind of... And this is probably a caveat as to why it may not end up being as good as the previous game. Uh, or it might do. We'll see. There's There might only be one proper way to do a level now, I think. Um, and I'll give you a very, very brief example of why. So there was one section I was doing where I had to go from a platform that disappeared after time, you know, very Nintendo, onto a wall run, which you can only keep for a few seconds, whilst then jumping off that, using another button to grapple, then using the slow-mo to make sure I could still make the jump. Then when I landed, I had to parry immediately uh, an attack while still maintaining enough speed to get past a button that I've pressed to open a door to get through without being killed. And then there were three melee enemies that I had to immediately parry as well. And that all happened in the space of five seconds. Okay? Nope. Nope. So <clears throat> that is the level of difficulty, and that required yeah, it requires both thumbsticks all the time, and it requires you know numerous button presses over several different buttons. I couldn't. You, I don't personally think you can do that with taking your fingers off the sticks. But get this: on the PC, at least, there's no control option where you can have all the buttons that you need for rapid action on the triggers and bumpers. Whichever one you choose, even the bumper jumper option, they always put one of them onto a face button where you have to take your finger off the off the sticks. So for me, that is a complete no-go. So I've gone 
purely 100% onto Steam Deck to play it, so I can assign stuff to yep. the back buttons and never have to take my finger off the, you know, off the sticks during combat. Um, so I'd say that's a really big flaw. I really do think they need to change it so that you have an option to have to have that on a standard pad. Um, and also my description there, which is 100% what you do just tells you how difficult it is and you know i died about a hundred times just on that one bit so probably half an hour just getting past that so it could turn like an eight hour game into like a 20 hour game easily uh and it's just whether you're gonna enjoy that or not and i am enjoying it i am enjoying it because it has got that depth that sophistication and when you beat a challenge it's really really satisfying but you have to think of it as each level is like a challenge in itself, like portal kind of thing, rather than, oh, I can just bounce around and use my skills and reactions to get out of it. No, there's some bits of it that are pure reaction and there are some bits of it that are pure memory and you have to combine the two. So it's going to divide people like the first game did. But for me, at the moment, it's going in the right direction. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> definitely not my game. I own the first one, uh, probably on a bundle or something like that. Uh, and I played it immediately after we spoke about it uh, a few days ago. I gave it a go, got through the first level, um, and just went, no, nah, that was too hard work. I wasn't <laughs> enjoying it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Not for me. Um, too much to remember. The enemies are, are brutal in it. And I can't. Yeah, it's too fast for me. Uh, nice and easy to see things. Not going to argue. Yeah. Visually. Uh, one of the better ones for me um, to be able to see where I'm going and stuff like that. But yeah, that's too much hard work for me these days. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I'll get on with number two. No. There's a demo. So anyone who wants to try it can have a go on the demo. And I would say alternatives are Neon White, which has some of that level of difficulty, but it has a much lower um, sort of threshold for getting out of the level. And Ghost Runner 2 and Ghost Runner. So that's an alternative. Obviously, Titanfall 2, which is a, an all timer and has a lot of the same elements. And um, Sprawl, that I talked about last week, uh, has a lot of the elements, but without the same level yes. of difficulty. So there are other options. Yeah. Good. Good, 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 good. Moving on. Right. So it's now on to spooky stuff. And because it's spooky stuff, Stu's a bit of a scaredy cat, so he's had to go. So you just got me for the next, however long it takes me to spew out my thoughts. So for the upcoming Halloween, I decided I'm going to play a couple of themed games, shall we say? A couple of spooky games. The first one of those is The Outlast Trials. Um, a quasi-sequel to The Outlast Games which were like these um, first-person, creep-em-up, survival, horror-y type psychological games uh, that some people got really scared of, but I didn't. Uh, basically, you played hide-and-seek, um, and there was a story that went along with it, and it used um, almost like a found footage type feel, I suppose, to, to give the scares. And this is very similar um, in terms of that you play a character, you, you go around a, an area and you've got to hide from the bad things and the things that are going to kill you um, and to, to try and survive, essentially. Except this time the game split up into um, three different characters, I think it is. I've played through one of them. And, well, what, played through one and, and started another. Uh, but you're like in this um, facility from um, someone called Murkoff, um, who's this doctory type person, I suppose, who's carrying out experiments. Um, and yeah, it's um, what you've got to do is try and get through the the, the, the world that you, you're put into and survive. Essentially, um, you get various tools to go with it, so you get like your uh, your uh, night vision camera that's kind of like attached to your head that you've got to collect batteries for um, you pick up health you pick up various different tools that could help you get through like you can maybe like blind the enemies or or, or, or things like that you kind of got to get through uncovering and investigating as you go along what's going on 
And yeah, you know, everything there. So you might walk on glass and that can attract the enemy. You can make different noises that can attract the enemy. Uh, you might just be happened upon by enemy creatures and, and, and inmates and, and things like that. Um, and you kind of like, you, you go through doing this investigation. And it's not, it's not scary. Um, and I've spoke before, I don't get scared by these sorts of games. Um, and the reason I don't find this one scary, it's a good game, really enjoying the game. But the reason I don't find this one scary is like many games of its type, it shows its hand too early. It shows um, the jump scares and it's like, oh, you're being chased. It's at its best, these games. And the first Outlast, I think, did this like early on at the very first, I think, 20, 25 minutes of it where you didn't know what you were doing. You was kind of, you drove up to the facility, like the hospital, whatever it was at the time. I've got to go back a few years now. You went in, you didn't know what was going on. And you was like lots of things in your sight, lots of noises. And it didn't show its hand. And that was unsettling. Um, and that got to me a bit. That, that made me tense up a bit as I was playing. And then it showed its hand. There was jump scares and blah, 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 blah. And it was like, ah, oh, okay. Um, I've kind of, yeah, right, okay, I'm fine now, um, it's done its thing, I'm, I know I've got to expect jump scares, and don't get me wrong, a jump scare is a jump scare, it doesn't matter how unscared you are, something jumps out at you, you're going to part, you go, oh, oh god, I wasn't expecting that, even when you're expecting a jump scare, this, this has plenty of jump scares, but what I really want from something like this, the meat and bone something like this, is the psychological side of it, um, I played a few years ago on stream a game called In Sound Mind. Uh, I think it was that did carry that psychological aspect to it and didn't show its hand and made you feel uneasy throughout the playthrough. So it can be done. Um, but this tries to do things um, to try and scare you. And I think when a game tries to scare you, for that effect, it doesn't always work. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, there are some people out there that are absolutely terrified by anything like this. But I can see the logical nature of it, and it's, it just doesn't work in many respects. Um, the kills are quite gory, um, quite fun, um, in all fairness. And some of the ideas behind it, so, you know, there's a... Uh, like what's like a good cop bad cop system it describes it as in in, in the um in, in the game where it tries to get you um it, it tries to teach you things it tries to give you a message in a way so what it's done well is like some of the best evil villains in in games and in movies are the ones where there's a gray area to them it's not just oh i just want to take over the world for taking over the world's sake that becomes an issue what you get is where there's some ambiguity to it so it's kind of this, it's trying to go like, here's the ideals of the old world. Um, this is where I feel the world should be going. So, that, you know, there's an ideology behind it that it wants to try and say, this is why this person's doing this thing. And it works. I think that all works really, really well. But it's kind of then wrapped up in a, ooh, jump scare, ooh, jump scare. Uh, very much like, I think the same, I'd say problem with like the evil within where that just became, oh, that you can know what's coming after you now. It's just hide. Uh, make sure you're hiding correctly and stay aside. Um, it, it, is, it is an issue for me, not for others. Uh, but that being said, the gameplay in the Outlast Trials is very, very, very good. Um, the hide-and-seek mechanics, I think, work really well. I think this is almost, for me a better video game adaption of the Saw franchise than Saw's ever put out, like the, like the Saw games have ever put out um, in, in many respects. Um, it tries to do some psychological things that work in places. So I'm not going to lie. I didn't go like, oh, psychological bits over. I'm now fully at rest. There's a couple of bits where it builds up tension and, and things like that. And it does work where I felt myself tensing up going, right, nothing's happened for a bit. Oh, okay, this is, I've got to go and do this. That's too far in the open. I don't want to be this far in the open. 
uh, because something's going to come for me. I know it's going to happen. So it does do the little bits, but because I know something's going to come and get me, therein lies the issue at times. Um, whereas for me, if it had that slight B of something might come for you and it doesn't, that would make me a lot more frightened um, and a lot more on edge. But that being said, the right circumstances, middle of the night, headphones on, Steam Deck in hand. By the way, runs brilliantly on the Steam Deck. Um, this is one of the better horror games that I've played. But I've only played the single player. There is co-op and multiplayer in it. Uh, you kind of go through it, and the single player is brilliant. Um, I don't know how it works with co-op. Um, hopefully, maybe get a chance at some point to try that. But yeah, do you know what? I don't get scared. I don't get scared, but this is a really good game in its own right. Um, so it's not based itself on, let's just go for scares, and that'll do. It's got the scare. It tries to do the scares, but it's built it around a solid, solid game. And that's the thing with the Outlast games as a whole is that, yes, the scary side of it is the hook, and that doesn't affect me too much, but they're solid games. Um, whereas I played, let's say, like Blair Witch, for example, wasn't a very good game, so the scares don't work, and the game doesn't hit, because I got bored. But yeah, no, this has got the sc- tries to do the scares, doesn't always hit with the scares, but it's a solid, solid game behind it. Recommended for a nice Halloween jump fest, I suppose. Um, yeah, Outlast Trials. Um, moving on, my other Halloween game I played is a demo. Uh, I've got sent this to preview. It's not actually out until next year. Uh, but it's called a Cabernet uh, by a party for introverts. And what you've got here is a story-driven vampire story. Really, I can't think of a better word for it. Yeah, it's basically... You play um, a young woman who, at the start of it, is dead. And you get given a series of questions. Um, Like, people describe you at your funeral. And um, you have to, uh, like, you go, oh, she was a a, a promising artist. And it will add to your stats based on what you decide you was at the time. And then you kind of find yourself woken up in a basement. um, And you get, like, different choices you can make. Um, that all that might add to your stats, allow you to level up your character. Uh, but you're kind of left in the dark a little bit as to what it is. Now, if you know it's a vampire thing, you know you're going to end up being like part of the like the vampire community. Um, but you go out, and it's set in this very um, Aristotle, Aristotle, not Aristotle, aristocratic um, uh, thing. Um, so you go there's this like aristocrat party going on. Um, and everyone's very well to do, but they're vampires, and you kind of like you discover that you've been bitten, and you are a vampire now yourself. And it's all conversation driven, point and click in places, and it's you're playing it, and you hear different conversations, and um, you kind of decide how you want to go. What what journey do you take as someone who has just been turned undead? Do you want to keep your humanity? Do you want to like go fully into the life of being a vampire? There's a morality system in there, which is a bit black and white in ways, but it, it, it's good to have. Um, so you can like feed on your victims as you as you go, and you could decide how much feeding you'll do and that can affect your morality and how far you turn to the dark side so to speak um and the morality system in this and the different characters works really really well um but this is only a demo that i've played so far uh but i got to a point in the demo where i went yep that's enough i'm i'm all in on this when this comes out um you know you get different vampire powers as you go um it's got a brilliant cast um, you know, you have to do things in it whilst it's night time. So, you know, you can't really do things during the day, um, obviously because um, vampires can't be out in sunlight. Uh, um, it's, yeah, you, there's, it, it's cool. You can turn into a bat. Um, always welcome stuff like that in video games. You've got, you know, vampires are brilliant when it comes to that. Um, 
I what I really like is that it's kind of set in this highlight, so everyone is well spoken, well to do, uh, but it's got this underbelly that haven't quite hasn't quite been revealed yet where I where I got to in the demo. But there's definitely this seedy underbelly there where you where you are. Um, uh, really brilliantly voice acted. Um, everything I've played so far is is voice acted, um, and it's got. You know, I think he's a Ben Potter from Triple Jump Games, is in it, um, which is just like, well, okay, yeah, if you if you say so, <laughs> if you say so, that's I, I don't get it, but sure, um, and yeah, it's so far as a demo, I I, I literally play the demo, give it a go uh, when you get a chance, stick it on your wish list because I think this could be. A pretty special game when it releases next year, but I yeah I'm all for this one. Um, I, I I wasn't expecting much. Oh, visually as well, it's kind of got this really um, nice gothic art style to it. Um, but it feels like it's a serious graphic novel in its visual style that works really well, and it kind of gives you that sense of of high life, high society to it. Um, and then, like the gothic nature of of the actual vamp- vampirism that goes with it is all there. Yeah, but it's it's really really good. Um, like the demo I've played is enjoyable. I want to play more, and it's done exactly what a demo should do. And that's Cabernet coming out next year. Um, just quickly before I finish off, um, and let's do come back in. Um, Couple of games I spoke about last week. I just want to follow up on that. I've I, I've had more time with. Um, firstly, City Skylines Two. Um, I think I mentioned some of the issues with performance and stuff like that. The devs are fully aware, and it is something they are working on. The game's massive, and they I think they set themselves up such a high target that it's going to be very difficult for them to to reach it. Um, now, I've not had any game breaking bu- bugs, but I generally play cities in very small chunks. Um, so I'll build an area, uh, zone it, do my little bits of uh, beautification that I like to do, and then that that's me done for a day. Um, whereas I know a lot of people who played for longer have come into some really performance issues, crashes, etc., etc., etc. So your mileage may vary, but as I said, this is it's definitely not a Steam Deck game. One hundred percent. You have to play this on a pretty beefy computer. Now, I would argue my twenty sixty i five um, is just about coping. Um, so you know, I don't know what you're going to get from your your systems um, or what configuration, but I just about cope um, at ten eighty p. Um, I don't, I've got a fourteen forty p monitor, but I play at ten eighty p, and I can get things like medium settings on it, which is which is fine um, for what it is. But they have promised there will be um, some updates. They are going to make sure it does work as well as it can, and their their track record suggests that yeah, they will. I think all their games, even going back to Cities in Motion, run badly to start with and improved. City Skylines definitely started badly and improved. Um, I know some people have got issues that there's going to be no Steam Workshop. They're doing their own mod system now. As long as it's nice and easy for me to be able just to go and install a mod, I haven't got to go into different file systems and replace files and stuff like that, then I've got no issue with it. Uh, because on Steam Workshop, there was a lot of trash as well. So if it can help them maybe get rid of some of the trash, that's good. Um, so we'll see. We'll see with that one. I played more um, Endless Dungeon um, from Sega and uh, Amplitude. And that is just oh, yeah, it's a brilliant game. Um, runs can last anywhere between 15 minutes to a couple of hours. Um, I'm making slow progress on that game, uh, discovering more, uh, working out better tactics. Uh, still only playing a single player of this, but oh, that gameplay loop is, is brilliant. Um, and just hopefully they can sort out the, the small text issues. They can get that sorted. Brilliant. Uh, but yeah, I'm having a grand time with that. I, I just absolutely adore it. Um, I even went back and played some of Dungeon of the Endless because I haven't played that for quite some time. 
And it made me appreciate that even more as well, because I think that's a brilliant game. Um, but yeah, Dungeon of the, uh, Endless Dungeon, sorry. Absolutely sublime. Absolutely sublime. And it's definitely up there for one of my recommended games of the year, uh, which I must update that at some point. But oh God, it's, yeah, it's really good. So yeah, that's that. Yeah, I will uh, let Stu come back in. So with that, thank you very much. I'll shut up now. Yeah, that's it from the podcast this week. So as usual, follow us on all the socials. Join us on Discord for a chat if you fancy it. Check out the website. And in the meantime, until next time, stay safe and stay sane.